Bible counselor, verse 6, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And He is, He is all of those, but He's not known to His people as all of those. Even in the church, to many in the church today, He's not known as being wonderful. That's right. To many, many, many multitudes in the church, he said, I counsel thee to buy of me silver, tried in the fire, to eye solve. And the, the Laodicean church age, the number one problem is men operating for God without following the counsel of God. The Apostle Paul said, I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And so we're, we're a people today absent the counsel of God. And we preached that last week and asked the question, how many young people have asked or sought counsel of their parents? And we had one young man stand up, and he's not a, a teenager at home or a young person at home. He's a man out in, 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 in life now. And uh, listen, we need to operate not according to our own wisdom, but according to wisdom and counsel. And there are times when we're going to need to ask advice and help with things. And we ought not to be slow to do that, but quick to do that. If you have a prayer request, ask someone to pray. I've got a prayer request tonight, an unspoken request, something I've been praying about. I, I feel like that, uh, that whatever answer the Lord's going to give, He's nearer to answering it. It's, I feel like I'm, my back's against the wall. I'd like to see Him answer it this week. He may not, but I, I feel like... I'd like to see the answer this week. I'd encourage you, invite you to pray with me. I just, it's just an unspoken request. Yes. And uh, I believe God answers prayer. Yes. And if God puts on your heart to pray about that, then you pray. Right. And if God, when God puts on my heart, and there's two ways we can do that. One is God will, I know this, God will bring things to our mind to cause us to pray. God will wake you up and put people in your heart to cause you to pray. And when you do that, it's not an accident. It's a necessity. Pray for that person when they're on your heart. And then, too, you can make reminders to pray. You can write things down. There's, there's no reason why we shouldn't have a prayer list. Because we forget. And when you, someone, someone asks for prayer and you say, I will pray, then you better write it down because you may forget. And then you've lied. And that person is, needs your prayers. And... So we need to remind ourselves to pray, but also understand God reminds us to pray. God puts specific prayers on our heart. We need to be in tune with God and know what God wants. But He's counselor. And oh, how God longs to be our counselor today. So many foolish decisions are made because He's not our, our counselor. Right. And how necessity, what a great necessity it is that we know Him as counselor. And then this next one uh, here tonight that we're going to look at. And uh, we had somewhat of an introduction to it this morning. Uh, but the mighty God. Who's that talking about? That's talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's gonna, he's go, He is the mighty God. And He's going to be known as the mighty God. And so chapter number 5 of Isaiah is a prophecy of the times now at hand concerning God's people. And Isaiah uh, shows that very clearly. And he shows how that the Jewish people... Uh, the, the branch and, and uh, how that they had a messenger sent to them and they rejected the messenger. And uh, so for a period of time, God would forsake his people. But that's not, that's a period of time. That's not in any way, shape or form, God saying to Israel, I'm finished. Israel is no more. It's a period of time where God forsakes his people because of their grievous sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. And they are right now, Israel, the Jewish people, the seed of Jacob, are right now under the punishment of God. But you know what? God only punishes His own children. Did you know that? God punishes His own children. God didn't destroy His people. He's punishing His people. And He's going to punish them further. But you know, among them... They can be saved. You know Jewish people can be saved. That's right. We went soul winning last Saturday. The one door that answered was a lady. She said, I'm Jewish, not saved. And we were able to witness to her and talk to her. I have her name written down. Any of you ladies would like to go back and visit her, uh, I can take you to her house. I can give you your address. You can go by and visit her. She's, she's an elderly lady. She needs to be saved. 
And I believe someone witnessed to her, she'd get saved. She needs to see Jesus and see what He did for her on the cross. And I believe she can be saved. So, and I'm going to show that to you here in just a minute. But in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is called to speak for God after the death of Uzziah. It said, uh, and, I, and, and notice how it says, y'all never forget Isaiah chapter number 6. Look at the introduction. It says here, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And he said in verse number uh, 3, and, and one cried and, and the other and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then in verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah was a product of Uzziah's time. I wish I could go back and read to you and we could study about Uzziah and uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26. How many of you read that today? Anybody read 2 Chronicles 26? Read it before you go to bed tonight or else the gauntlet is coming down. 2 Chronicles 26. I want you to read about Uzziah. And uh, read that. 2 Chronicles 26. Not right now, but when you get home. Read it. And uh, Uzziah was, uh, as I said a moment ago, he loved the nation of Israel. And he was a great king. For 50 plus years he ruled well. But near the end of his reign, he was lifted up in pride and he died as a leper. And Isaiah, Isaiah thought well of Uzziah. He was a friend. He was a follower. He was a confidant. And Isaiah didn't realize that he had been swept up into the very same mentality as Uzziah. Uzziah's sin was a reflection of the heart of his people. They all had become proud. And in their prosperity, they had forgotten who God was. They had put Uzziah too high. And when Uzziah died, Isaiah was able to see God and see his own proud condition. And Isaiah repented and God began to use Isaiah. He said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And God touched his lips and anointed Isaiah, and Isaiah became a great prophet to the nation of Israel. Yes, he did. And he became a prophet to all nations. One of the greatest preachers and prophets of all times is the man Isaiah, greatly used of God. Then in chapter number 7, I want you to see the, the king that came after Uzziah was named Ahaz. Ahaz, I believe, is typical of so many of God's people today unwilling to let God be God. You know what God wants in your life? From the youngest person here tonight to the oldest, God wants to be God. God wants to, if I may say, He wants to flex His might. He wants you to see how powerful He is. and He wants you to see how strong He is and how mighty to save He is. Somewhere in the Bible, we've got to get this back. We've got to capture once again in the Bible the fact that we serve an almighty God, a powerful God. Right. Our God's not weak. He's not aged with the ages. He's not wearied with the days and the months and the years. He's as strong and powerful and mighty as He ever was. And He is still looking for people that will call on Him and trust Him and believe in Him. He said in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Why? So that we can get the glory? So that we can get the praise? So that we can uh, glorify men? No. So that we can glorify God. Yeah. Right. I tell you what the year 2018 needs. The year 2018 needs a revival of God's people praying and looking to God and trusting God to do impossible things. Great and mighty things. Right. Listen, I weary of this. It's nonsense. I, I mean, I, we're, we're nobody. But my, my wife and I, God's given us ten children. We have a little boy, in case you didn't know, coming just near December, near Christmas time. That'll be our eleventh child. You say, how can you do that? Well, we can't do that. It's impossible to do that. There's no way we can do that. There's no way we can provide. No way based on our income that we can do that. But God provides work, and He provides income, and He provides blessing, and God provides a way, and God 
God provides food and God meets our needs. And I'm weary of people saying, well, we just can't do it. And Christian people, I just can't afford that. I just can't do that. Shame on us for not trusting God. Shame on us for not believing God. God's able to do all things. And listen, how are we to ever believe God and see God move and revival if we can't trust God to take care of our necessities? God's able. He's no less God today than He was in the day of Isaiah. He's still God. He's God in the day of Moses. And He's God today. And He's God in the days of Elijah. And He's God today. He's the Almighty God. He's the Mighty God. Amen. We've got to get back to understanding that He is wonderful. That He is Counselor. You say, what does it mean that He's wonderful? It means there's things He wants to show you that you could never imagine. Listen, I have not seen nor heard nor entered the heart of man. He said, I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. I mean, God is looking for somebody that will challenge Him, that will call Him out and trust God and believe God and put everything in the hand of God and believe that He is the mighty God and there's nothing too strong for Him. When I was a little boy, forgive me, but I thought, in my mind, I thought my dad was a plumber. I thought he was a, a mechanic. I mean, I knew he was a boiler maker. I didn't even know what that meant. But listen, hey... We never called anybody to fix anything. I mean, that was not, not, it was not Dad's pride. But if something went wrong, he'd fix it. Amen? And uh, there might have been times he should have called. And there's a lot of duct tape used around our house. Amen? And a lot of plumbing fixed with duct tape. And a lot of, a lot of, th- a lot of things that probably could have, got, maybe, maybe he could have got some help on. But listen, Dad just said, I'll find a way to do it. And in my little mind as a little boy, I looked at my dad and I thought, my dad can do anything. Yeah. I mean, one time I was playing Little Creek Park at a church picnic. And we were playing over there. And I got into a little tussle with a little boy. And... That's a fight, if you don't know what that means. We were fighting, but yeah, we were fighting back and forward, and, and I uh, got the best of him, and he said, I'll go get my daddy. And I said, that's all right. I said, my, my, my dad's over there. I said, and my big brother's over there too. Go get him. <laughs> Amen. And listen, I hey, and uh, I, I figured I'd get them involved in the fight too. I mean, I, I, never, I never worried when my dad was around. I never feared. I wasn't afraid. Never was afraid. Had no reason to be afraid because he was bigger, tougher, Stronger, and he could shoot fast, straighter than anybody else around. I never worry. Why should I worry when I have God to take care of me? Why should I fret? You say, preacher, do you not know what's going on? And no, I really, I don't listen to the news much. I don't need to. I know what's going to say. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This nation is a nation of fools. This nation is a nation that by and large has departed from God. This nation is a nation that doesn't want to hear what the Bible says. They don't want to hear what an old-fashioned preacher has to say. They don't want to hear what the Bible says. They're not interested in what the Bible says. But I say to you that, listen, you and I that are saved need to care what the Bible Bible says we need to know what the Bible says and we need to let them know what the Bible says whether they like it or not yeah. and we need to let them know that we serve a powerful God a mighty God and we need to trust God to do great things and call on to him and believe in him and let and exercise our faith in him Ahaz is the exact opposite of that and if any man in the Bible drew the ire of God it was Ahaz yeah. because he said no I'm not going to tempt God He said, I will not. He refused. When he was commanded to pray, he refused to pray. Mm -hmm. Look what it said in Isaiah chapter number um, 7. And uh, we're we're not uh, that, uh, let's see. Is it yes? Isaiah chapter number 7. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Syria, the king, uh, king of Judah, that reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Hermalia, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, the house of Judah, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people as the trees... The Bible said, And the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirjashub the son, at the end of the conduit, at the upper at the at the uh, conduit of the upper pool, the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed, 
and be quiet. He said to Ahaz, or to, to Isaiah, he said, go meet Ahaz. He told him where he would be. He said, when you see him, go tell him. He said, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand. Neither shall it come to pass. He said, Isaiah, he said, you go tell Ahaz. He's worried. He's fretting. He's got his bunch of little sissy, pusillanimous, weak counselors together. And they're adding fuel to the fire. And Ahaz is weak anyway. And he's got a bunch of effeminate leaders up there. And they're all worried and nervous saying, what are we going to do? And it won't be long before they're going to be talking surrender. Because they don't believe in me. And they don't know me. And they won't trust me. And Isaiah, I want you to go up there and meet them in the conduit where they're walking up there. You'll recognize recognize them. They're sweating. They're nervous. Their knees are knocking together. And you go tell them that I know what the plan is. And I know what's going on. And I know what their counsel is. I know all about it. And bless God, it will not stand. Why won't it stand? Because God said it won't stand. All, listen, all the enemies that are against the church today, all the enemies that are against the work of God today, you let them come. and Let them say what they want to say and try to shut down the work of God and silence the preachers. It will not stand. It will not stand. Amen. It will not stand. No matter how wicked they are. No matter how liberal they are. It doesn't matter how much they hate that book. There's a war against that book right there. There's a war against the people of God. There's a war on the church of God. There's a war against the people of God. But I'm going to tell you something. It's a guaranteed fact that the people of God have already won the battle. Amen. Let them war. Let them fight. We ought not ever fret. We oughtn't to worry. It may enter into our heart, but when it does, we need to get right with God and say, God, I believe and trust and know that you're able. That's right. We're more than conquerors through him that saved us. Listen, thank God, we're more than conquerors. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The mighty God rules in me. I've been saved since I was seven years old. You know who saved me? The mighty God saved me. Amen. 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 He said here in, uh, in this passage, it shall not stand. Neither shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it shall not be a people. He, God said, I've got a plan for Ephraim. And within this period of time, there will not be an Ephraim. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe... Surely you shall not be established. Who's he saying that to? Ahaz. If you will not believe, you're always going to be weak. To not be established means to be weak. That's right. I don't remember what it was. I mean, we were looking at those windmills, and Brother Chris brought up the subject of the weight of the windmill, so thank God for Google. We Googled it. Amen. 75 tons per windmill. The foundation can go, what was it, up to 30 foot deep? Is what what said? Up to 30 foot deep. The foundation for that windmill. Amazing. You know what that's called? Being established. Yeah. You know, they don't put that up and say, boy, I hope it stays. You think it'll stand? I don't know. We better wait and see if this one's good or not. No, you can't afford for that to fall down. Amen. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why are we worrying? Why are we nervous? Why are we doubting? Why are we living in such a generation of fretting people worried, wondering if we're going to make it or not? Can you imagine how in the world does anybody sit in a church where they don't even preach the security of the believer? How many of you think you're saved tonight? Well, I hope you make it all the way through the week. Amen. But if not, come back next week and I'll tell you how to hold on. 
Cross your fingers. That's nonsense. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. My Savior, my Savior is a mighty Savior. And He's able to save. He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto Him. And I'm saved to the uttermost. I'm saved today. I'll be saved tomorrow. And if I live to be 70, I'll be saved at 70. At 80, I'll still be saved. At 90, I'll still be saved. I'm saved all the way to glory. I couldn't be more saved. Amen. B.R. Lakin used to say, he said, you'll never have to get to heaven and get in your mansion and walk down the street and you'll see a sign over there that says Vacancy. And you inquire, what happened there? Oh, that was old Joe. He was saved, doing good for a while, but he didn't make it. There at the end, he fell out. So now his mansion's empty. We had it all ready for him. That's not salvation. How should we should neglect if we escape so great salvation? The great salvation of God is so great and it's able to save all that would come to Him. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the book. Thank God for so great a salvation, the mighty Savior. Ahaz uh, said here in the head of Ephraim, he said, If it will not believe, you surely you shall not be established. And verse number 10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign. It's like this. Look at this. It's like God sent Isaiah to Ahaz. Follow this picture. And he, and, and he told Ahaz, he said, You better trust me. And Isaiah walked away. It's like God was saying, I, it's like he said, I, that Ahaz is irritating me. Isaiah, get back over there. I got something else I want you to do. Go over there and tell him that I said to ask for a sign. Yep. And there's Isaiah knocking on the door. Isaiah comes out, or Ahaz comes out and says, Who is it? And Isaiah says, It's me. He said, God sent me back over here. <laughs> he said, He sent me back over here. He said for you to ask a sign. He wants to show you something, big boy. And Ahaz, Uzziah said, uh, I'm not going to do it. Verse 11, ask the sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. God said there's no limit. You can't ask anything too small or anything too big. You go ahead and ask. 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 Yeah. You say, boy, I wish God would do that to me. Well, He did. Sure. Amen. Right. He does. Yes. He asks each and every one of He tells us the, the, one of the most oft repeated commands in the Bible is for us to pray. God has to tell us, command us to pray. Mm -hmm. Admonish us to pray. Right. It's sad. It's a shame that we have to be commanded to pray. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? You know, it wearies God when we won't ask. God throws a bone. Fetch it. Bring it back to me. Now some dogs, my, our dog, our lab's not this way. Now he's getting there. Chase is old now. I used to be able to throw a stick and he would run and catch it until he was about to fall over. Now I'll throw it and he's tired of that game. He's wearied of that game. I throw it and he said, you want it? Go get it. He'll go get it once or twice and he's done with that game. Now old Bo, you can throw that stick all day long and I mean he's too dumb to quit. That's the way we ought to be as Christians. Every time God throws the bone, fetch, go get it. We weary God because we won't do what God said to do. Right. So I'm glad this sermon don't apply to me. I'm still a teenager. It ain't kicked in on me yet. It has. <laughs> yeah, it has. Teenager, what are you asking God? What big thing are you asking God? Churchman, what are you asking God? How many of you, how, what are we asking God? Young person, what are you asking God? You asking to direct your life? What provisional need do we ask? What great prayer request do we have that we ask God? What amazing thing are we asking God to do in our life? So I'm not a Pentecostal, I know. I wouldn't be preaching to you if you were, but you are a Christian. 
And I'm preaching the Bible to God's people tonight, and God said for us to ask. We serve a great God. He can do great things. And He said He would do great and mighty things which thou knowest not. But the key is, if you don't believe, you won't be established. And the way you are established is by finding out that God is able to do the impossible. I like what it said about Abraham. He staggered not at the commandment in Romans chapter 4. Now he laughed when God told him he was going to have a baby, but then in Romans chapter 4 said he believed. He staggered not. I don't know why he laughed. I don't think it's because he doubted God. He says, well, you would laugh too. He said, Sarah, guess what? I mean, hey, uh, God still believes, still saying that it's going to happen. What else could you do, cry? I mean, it's an emotion. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. You know what God's looking for? Is people that believe him. People that will ask him. That will trust him. How many of you, how frustrating is it when you know how to do something and nobody will ask you? Isn't that frustrating? I mean, you know the answer and they won't ask. You know, you watch those stupid game shows and you know the answer. And, ah, you just yell at the TV and they can't hear you. <laughs> and that one where they phone a friend and you're not the friend. And you're telling them what the answer is. I can just see Brother Juan hollering up there, you know. <laughs> Wanted to be on the wheel of fortune. I can see him jumping up and down and you know and running down there like that. And, yeah, I mean, and uh, pulling that wheel. And I don't know why I'm at right now. <laughs> Amen. But listen, hey, believe God is able to do all things because He is. Look what it said. They said in verse number eleven, they had said, "I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord." And He said, "Hear you now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel." What does that mean, Emmanuel? God with us. God with us. You know what God wanted Israel to know that He was with them. You know what God wanted Judah to know? You know what God wanted Jerusalem to know? You know what God wanted Ahaz to know? You know what God wanted the little boys and girls in Jerusalem to know? The same thing that David knew. That God is with us. Hey, why did David go down and slay a lion and a bear? Why did he go down in the valley of Elah and slay the Philistine? I'll tell you why. Because he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that when he went down in that valley to fight that giant Philistine, he wasn't going alone. He knew that God was with him. And but listen, what makes a David what makes a Daniel? What makes uh, those men like that? What makes a mighty warrior for God is somebody that knows that God is with them. Unshakable faith. What makes a great lady for God is a lady that knows God's with me. What makes a great man of God, what makes a great woman of God is someone that knows that God is with us. And if God be with us, who then can be against us? Amen. The mighty God. Yeah. When you got saved, can I tell you who came inside you? The mighty God. Amen. The wonderful counselor. The mighty God. Amen. You know what America needs to know today? The mighty God. Yes. You know what our world needs to know tonight? The mighty God. You know what the lost Hindus in India and the Sikhs, you know what they need to know? They need to know the mighty God. Listen, the Buddhists in Japan, they need to know the mighty God. The Islamists in Asia need to know the mighty God. The Catholics throughout the world, they need to know the true and the living, the mighty God that He's able to save. Amen. They don't know they're saved. They think, they hope, they wish, they wonder, they fret. Mother Teresa's biography is not available. Try to find it. She wrote one. Mm -hmm. No sooner than it was on the shelves, it was bought off the shelves. You, you can't find it. Let me tell you why. Because in her autobiography, she said this. Mother Teresa, one of the greatest people, maybe, ever to live, said, I often cannot sleep at night because when I lay my head on the pillow, I worry and I fear where I'll wake and I'll, where I'll be in eternity. And I hope I've done enough yeah. to merit heaven. Catholicism gives no hope because they don't know the mighty Jesus. That's right. 
Islam gives no hope because they don't know the mighty Jesus. We have a Savior. If you could sit here tonight and say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm going to heaven when I die, do you know that we ought to, be, we ought to rejoice when we say that? I mean, that Amen. ought to do something. I know. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able. No wonder Paul was so excited. He said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. That word ready means a lot. But he said, I can't wait. No wonder Paul couldn't sleep. Can you imagine traveling with him? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, Paul, go to bed. Go to bed. It's dark out. Everybody's in bed. Okay. He lays there and you hear him rolling, tossing, and turning, preaching in his sleep. Yeah. By 4 a.m. you hear him up, shuffling around, kicking around. And the disciples, Luke, Mark, whoever, Mark, saying, Paul, go back to bed. He said, I can't. He said, I can't wait. It's almost daylight. He said, got two hours. It's okay. I go, just go ahead and rest a little bit. I'm, I'm up. I'm up. I'm getting ready. I can't wait. Can't wait to preach. He said, there'll be people out there bright daylight. He said, I want to go preach to them. All right, come on. It's time to go preach. They said, Paul, let's take a break. It's time for lunch. He said, oh, let's preach a little bit longer. But we're hungry. Okay. All right, let's get back to it. Let's preach a little bit longer. I mean, listen, he walked near over 200 miles or more in his whole entire ministry. Why? Because he couldn't wait to get to the next city. He couldn't wait to get to the next town. He'd see a multitude of people. He couldn't wait to preach and tell them about the Savior that he met on the road to Damascus who was able to take an old lost sinner and save him and change his life and give him a blessed hope and assurance of salvation. Yeah. Paul never had to doubt again. No, he, he knew he was saved. He knew he was entirely unworthy, but by God's grace, he was saved. Amen. You take that word S-A-V and put E-D on it, that's past tense. I'm no grammatical genius, but I know that E-D settles the matter. Yeah. Saved, past tense, it's settled. It does. <laughs> My faith and trust is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I'm glad for the salvation we have, amen? The, yeah. mighty, the mighty Savior. The mighty Jesus. He said, uh, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Now, we could continue to read there, but we're not going to. And we're not even going to finish the message tonight. But we're going to have fun getting there. Look at verse number 16. Verse number 17. The Lord shall bring... Upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the days that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall, re and, 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 and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor uh, that is hired, namely by them beyond the river by the king of Assyria. The, the head and the hair of the feet and it shall also consume the beard and it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give he shall eat butter for butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land and it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand and a thousand silverlings it shall even be for briars and thorns with arrows and with bows shall men come thither because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns. But it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. What's he saying? He's saying that hardship awaits you, Israel, mm -hmm. Judah, because you wouldn't ask. Right. Ahaz, you're bringing hard times on your people. You know where hard times come from? It comes from a departure from God. You know why America is headed for hard times? Hard God. Because we've departed from God. Yep. We've stopped asking God. And because of that, America as a nation is headed for hard times. That's right, now, the next chapter, chapter number 8, as I continue my commentary here, trying to get there, amen? Chapter number 8 is a blessed chapter, and I don't, we're not going to read all of it. I know I say that, and then I end up doing it. But look at verse number 11. Chapter number 8, verse number 11. Let's just see if you can get this or not. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Well, I love this. 
Notice it carefully. I'm going to reread it and read it very slow. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them whom this people shall say, a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my... What's that next word? Is that in... Did y'all see that? Among my... Disciples, what, what all those uh, disciples of Jesus, what people were they again? Were they Gentiles? No. No. Matthew, he, he was a Jew. Mark, Luke, Philip, Bartholomew. So they were all Jews. Sorry. They were all Jews. The Bible said. Look at it, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will, what's that? Look for him. Amen. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Who's he talking to there? Who's Isaiah talking to there? Anybody want to guess? The starts with an R, the rim the remnant. The small remnant. God said he would always have what? A small remnant. In Isaiah chapter number eight, he's talking to the small remnant, the disciples. They're going to be a sign. They're going to be looking for him. You know, when Jesus came, when he was born as a baby, if you go back and study, there was a handful of people, just maybe less than that handful, that were waiting for him. There was a lady. There was a priest. They were waiting for him. You know, today, there's, at, when Jesus was on the cross, there was just a handful there on the cross at his side. When he was in the upper room, there was just a handful there waiting for him. They were waiting, watching. Can I tell you tonight, the remnant, here's, here's the thing, the remnant is larger tonight than it's ever been. I've seen it. Young people, you, you don't know how blessed you are. You've seen it. Bob said it. Saw those young men. Hard preaching. Wasn't it? Hard preaching. I mean, I don't know if some of you could take some of that preaching he heard this week. I mean, I don't know. You, it's, I mean, you might walk away thinking I'm a buttercup because we're weak. By the way, listen, don't be offended by hard preaching. Amen. Don't be. Listen, if the preacher rubs you the wrong way, just go home and ask. God. Don't, don't, be, don't be a wimp. <coughs> don't, be, don't be soft and effeminate. Don't, don't, let, don't be fooled by the devil. Listen, preaching doesn't need to back up and backpedal. That's right. Don't believe this. Lie. Well, who does he think he is? Well, he might, he, you know, he might just be preaching his opinion, but it might be a good idea because there's some opinions and ways that have been forsaken in America. I mean, America's better off 75 years ago than it is tonight. Amen. Don't be offended by hard preaching. That's right, preacher. Well, who does he think he is? Well, just, just go ahead and listen. Amen? You know what I do? I say amen even when I don't like it. That, I found out they'll just move on faster if I say amen. <laughs> so you agree with everything you hear? No, I don't agree with everything I hear, but I like it. Amen? I like to hear a man preach. I like preaching. Amen. I do too. If someone's railing on me, that's a little different. I endure that. Amen? But I like to hear preaching. So why do you say that? Well, we saw that. We, we were at a, a, a youth conference in Indiana. We saw a church building full, four or 5,000 people, young people singing and praising the Lord. Did y'all did miss, did y'all see that? Did you hear that little group, them little 
boys and girls, they came up there and sing. They weren't, they weren't, uh, they had a singing competition, so to speak, and a little old group of kids came up there and sang from a little old church up in New York somewhere. And if you close your eyes, you'd have thought a group of trained college kids. Matter of fact, they sing better than the college tour group. And one little old boy was that tall, Brother Mullins, he couldn't have been nine years old, and he just singing at the very top of his lungs. You see, tonight, the remnant is bigger than it's ever been. There's more of us than you think. We're not some splinter group that's dying and shriveling up. No. On, fr- on Thursday afternoon, Brother Wilkerson there at the church had the missionaries come and they filled the whole area. There must have been 40 or 50 missionaries come and stand up there. And some gave testimony. And those are people that, that are off on some mission field somewhere preaching and teaching the gospel. And God is moving and God is still working and there's still a remnant of people that are looking for Him. We're we're in the greatest thing that ever happened. You know why it's the greatest thing that ever happened? Because of who started it. That's right. Jesus started it. Amen. You know who's going to finish it? Jesus is going to finish it. You know who gets to be a part of it? We do. We're right in the midst of it. We're a part of it. You know what's going to happen someday? We're going to be up there in heaven. John saw it, an innumerable host. You know who he saw there? Himself. And he saw us there. Prophetically, he saw you. He saw your family, your loved ones that are already saved. He saw us all up there praising the Lamb, saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Every saint that's ever died, they're there, they're waiting. Someday we'll be there with them. Amen. I mean, it's it's amazing. There's a remnant. And then I want you to see in chapter number 9, and we're going to close tonight. Look at chapter number 9. I don't want you to miss this. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first... He lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Does Galilee ring a bell to anybody? Anything significant ever happen in Galilee? That's where Jesus' ministry started. Jordan, Galilee. Let's look at verse number two. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. You know, no people ever walked in the darkness that the people of Naphtali and Zebulun and Galilee and Jordan walked in. Walked in some of the greatest darkness. But you know where Jesus came? The light shineth in the darkness. Matthew, Matthew 4.15 says in verse 16, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. That's Matthew chapter 4. Isaiah prophesies not just of the name, but of the cause of Christ. The New Testament church, Isaiah may not have understood it, but the New Testament church, church, the work of the gospel among the Gentile nations, your salvation, my salvation, the ministry of the Apostle Paul and Titus and Timothy and and all the other preachers and all throughout the ages and all the revivals and all that still goes on today was prophesied. And it all started in the land of darkness where sin abounded grace. That's much more abounded. Amen. See, Brother, why were there so many demons in that day? Because it was a time of darkness. There was demon possession. It was a time of darkness. The devil was certain of one thing. He felt certain that he had wrested power from God. And the prince of the power of the air felt sure that it was time for him to seize hold of his kingdom. 
And right in the midst of gross darkness, when the devil, after 400 years of silence, and it seemed like God had stepped away from the earth, right in the middle of it, a baby was born in a lowly manger. And his name is Jesus. You girls aren't playing a game, are you? You're not playing tic-tac-toe or anything. I'd hate to think that you were. If you are, I'll pray for you. Listen, he said, he said, and uh, so I'm easily distracted. Y'all have to forgive me for that. I just, and it's not because, it's just because of this book right here. I just want you, I don't want you to miss this. Amen. I want you to, I want you to act like you're listening. I want you to fake me out. I want you to act interested. I remember hearing the story about some prisoners of war in Germany. They were taken and they were put in a prison cell. One of them managed, Brother Jim, somehow to smuggle in a, a little section of the Bible wrapped up in their pocket, folded real small. And when they got in that prison cell, there was a little light that would shine in about 12 foot up. And those men would make a, a ladder and they would one get on the other one's shoulder and they would get up to where that light shined in and they would unfold that little script of Bible and they would hold it in the light and they would read. Christians were persecuted in Russia. Russia was trying to stamp out Christianity and they were placed in the mines and they were, they were, they were eventually they were put in the, in the lowest part of the mine and it was so bad that their wardens or their persecutors were afraid to come to where they were. And one day it occurred to them, they won't come back here. So they got back in that section where no one would come and you know what they started doing? They started having church back there. Yep. Amen? Good. doesn't matter how bad it gets. And it could get bad and... I don't want you, that's why I say things to you sometimes to get your attention, young people. It's not because I'm mad at you, because I love you. I don't want you to take for granted the opportunity that you have to sing in a church choir and to be in a New Testament church and see the things in church. I don't want you to either. I don't want any of us to. The Bible is precious, more Amen. precious than gold. Amen. Listen, he said... Verse number 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. As in the days of Midian. That's referencing the great victory that Gideon won. Little as much when God is in it. You know, Jesus took 12 men from the shores of Galilee. That's where, by the way, they came from. Galilee, Midian, that land of set and darkness. Fishermen! One of them was a traitor. Gideon had 300. Jesus had 11. But from that eleven, and then at the cross there was only three there. And then in the upper room there was just a small assembly there, about 120 in the upper room. But from that small number, and Jesus never had a great following, but from that small multitude, from that small number, from that small band of men, one of them named Simon Peter, uh, from this area here, a fisherman, a cursing, swearing fisherman, after he had seemed like he had fallen away from God, rededicated his life, and after Jesus went back to heaven, he stood up and preached an unlearned and foolish man I despised by the people but he stood up and preached and 3,000 were saved and baptized in one day and then a little bit later 3,000 here 5,000 there who are these? these are they that have turned the world upside down have come hither also and the mighty cause of Christ began to grow and from that day to this day no one has ever been able to stop it and no one ever will be able to stop it and the only ones that can hinder it that can slow it down is us yeah because we don't believe that He's the mighty God. Believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land 
of the living. Amen? Amen. Look what it said. We got, we're going to close. Isaiah chapter number 9. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. I don't have time to go to it, but in Acts chapter 1 and 2, the Spirit of God came as a clove, cleaving their tongues as a flame of fire. As a fire. Say, what's the fuel? Right here. The prophet said, I was going to quit. But I couldn't. Because your word was in my heart as a... What does it say? As a burning fire. As a burning fire. He said, I could not stay. He said, the fire of your word burned in my heart. I couldn't stay still. This right here will fuel the fire. Amen. We don't need churches with less Bible. We need more Bible in our church. Amen. Amen. More preaching. More preaching of God's Word. Amen. Grounded and fashioned and formed and molded in the Bible. Let the Word of God burn in your heart. Amen. Look what it said. That's the fuel. He said every fire, every battle is of confused noise. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. A fire that cannot be put out. Cannot be put out. For unto us a child is born. Amen. That's the great proclamation. Yes. Amen. That's the great hope. Whether Ahaz wanted to believe it or not, God said you're going to get it anyway. Amen? Amen. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Amen. of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no, no end. I guess if God says no end, then no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will. Don't miss that statement. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The preacher, it won't get done if we don't do our part. Yet yeah, will. God will find somebody else to do it. But you and I need to do our part. Amen. So we can be a part of the great work that God has. Amen? You say, I can't do it. You're right, you can't. But God can. And God enables us. Dear Heavenly Father, we'll close tonight. Lord, thank you for these great truths that Isaiah preached. God, I pray that we would apply them in our life. Dear Lord God, take them to heart. Father, thank you for the Word of God. I pray you're blessed now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed and eyes closed. Why don't